And so dealing with this word divine feminine, I want to first get something understood. The word divine can be defined as God, something close to God, or anything relating to God. So when we talk in the divine feminine, we're talking about the feminine counterpart or the feminine principles as it relates to God or the Most High. And since we've been under the influence and spiritual leadership of false prophets and false teachers, we never really received the full truth um, or the true teachings that is contained in the Bible, especially anything pertaining to a divine feminine or a feminine presence or counterpart with the Most High. Our Bible um, has a Roman and Greek influence and they would have you believe everything dealing with the Most High is masculine, but we know that um, everything in our nature have a masculine and a feminine counterpart. I see the daughters of Zion looking for themselves in many different religions and spiritual ideologies of the world, and they're trying to find themselves in these ideologies. I understand um, how the Bible have painted women in a real bad light and how scriptures have been twisted in order to perpetuate uh, certain ideas when it comes down to women. But the truth of the matter is, is that the woman was created as the embodiment of divine wisdom. This is why she have a keen sense um, known as intuition. Now we all have intuition, but the woman um, master the art of living by intuition. But it's time we give the woman her crown and allow her to receive her true identity and her true place with the Most High on the side of the sons of God. So I want to uh, set the foundation by going to Proverbs, the eighth chapter. Now, if you go to the first verse of this chapter, you'll see that this is wisdom speaking. And throughout that entire chapter, wisdom is referred to as she or her. But starting on the 22nd verse, going through the 31st verse, we read, And the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way. Before his works of old, I was set up from everlasting. From the beginning or ever the earth was, when there was no depths, I was brought forth. When there was no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was, I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest parts of the dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth. When he established the clouds above. When he strengthened the fount fountains of the deep. When he gave to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment. When he appointed the foundations of the earth. Then I was by him as one brought up with him. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Rejoicing in the habitable parts of, the, of his earth. And my delights were with the sons of men. So what we're going to do is go to the book of Genesis, the first chapter, starting with the first verse in the very beginning before anything was created to see if wisdom was there with the Father. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And so there's two words I want to pull out. And I want to take a close look at out of these three verses. And that'll be spirit and light. And so the word used for spirit is Ruach. Ruach. And it goes back to H7307 in your concordance. I'm using Blue Letter Bible so you can follow along if you'd like. But in your concordance, H7307 is Ruach. This is the word used for spirit. It is a feminine noun, meaning that it is a feminine person, place, thing, or an idea. It is defined as the spirit, wind, or breath. So the Ruach is the breath. It is a feminine noun. And it was with the Most High at the beginning before anything was created. Now the next thing that was created, or the first thing I should say that was created, was or. That word or is light. This is the word used for light. And it goes back to the H216. It is also a feminine noun. And it means illumination. As in enlightenment. So um, what I wanted to do was compare this word light and darkness. Just to 
sort of bring home the point that this light that we see isn't just a physical light, but it's also pointing to something deeper. It's pointing to illumination or enlightenment. Now, when you see the darkness, um, the word for darkness is Hosek H2822, and it is a masculine noun, and it's defined as ignorance and wickedness. And so light representing illumination and darkness representing ignorance and wickedness. Okay, so we see that the word Ruach, which is a feminine noun, moved over the face of the dip. It was with the Father from the beginning. And we also see light, which is or, which also is defined as illumination or enlightenment, wisdom. And it was the very first thing created before anything was created. Now, if you're saying that the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Wisdom is not one and the same and they're two different uh, things, then I have a video that I'll do another time to really point out that the spirit of wisdom and the holy spirit is one and the same but both are feminine so both represent the feminine principle and that's what we're dealing with we're dealing with the divine feminine as it relates to the bible and so this is the feminine principle as it relates to the most high the ruach the spirit of god in the or or the enlightenment the illumination wisdom now, when you drop down to the 22nd, excuse me, 26th through 28th verses, we read, And the Most High said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So the Most High created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Now, jot down that word multiply, um, because we're going to go back to it. But that word corresponds to H735 Rabbah. Rabbah. Remember that. Multiply, linking back to Rabbah. And so now here's wisdom. If the Most High said, let us create man in our image, meaning more than one person, and after our likeness, and the Most High created man in the image of the Most High, he created him male and female. Male and female was the result of the, of, uh, the Most High saying, let us create in our image. Let us create man in our image. And as a uh, result of that you get male and female which is showing us that the us that um is pointing to in this in this verse is the masculine and feminine principle this is the most high in the ruach or the spirit of wisdom being manifested as the masculine and feminine principles in the flesh man and woman was created to be the representation or the reflection of the most high in his wisdom also known as the holy spirit in the flesh Let's 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 uh, drop this point home a little bit more. And so now we have man being created. The man is being created. We have the masculine and the feminine principle. We have the Most High and the Ruach uh, saying, "Okay, let us make man in our image, male and female." So we have the man being created. Uh, Genesis chapter two, verse seven. And the Most High said, formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The Most High formed man from the dust of the ground. The dust of the ground represents the elements. All right, if you want to know what the elements are, go and go look at the elemental chart and you will see these elements is the, um, the, the makeup of everything in our physical reality. But man was created from the dust of the ground and the Most High breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Now we already saw that the definition for Ruach, uh, one of the definitions was the breath, was breath. So we see that it was the Ruach because the Ruach is the spirit of life. Wherever the Ruach is, there's life. So when the Most High breathed the Ruach or the breath of life into Adam, Adam became a living soul. I also want to point out the word breath. When you look at the word used for breath um, in the biblical Hebrew, it go back to Neshama. Neshama H5397 is also a feminine noun. And it, two of the definitions is divine inspiration and intellect. So we even have in the breath uh, also reflecting wisdom or divine wisdom, right? The Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit come, uh, it, she bring life, but she also bring divine wisdom and intellect. So, you know, when, when the Ruach is involved, there's a dualistic um, office that, that she's holding. Right, she's the spirit of life, but she also represents the spirit of wisdom. So we see the breath that's being breathed into Adam. The neshama also represents the divine inspiration and the intellect. And so now it's time for us to make woman. And 
This is why woman was taken from man because man represents the physical elements or the material, the physical, and the woman represents the spiritual. And so in order to get woman, you have to take that feminine principle out of man that was just breathed into man, the Ruach, the Ruach, the breath of life, the spirit of life. So we go to Genesis second chapter. And the Most High caused the deep sleep to fall on Adam and removed a rib and closed up the flesh thereof. And the rib he took from man, he created woman. Now the word that is used for rib is H6763. And this word is Salem. Salem. And the definitions is as curved, aside, timber, plank, beam, and board. Now, if you're using the blue letter over to the side, you'll have um, a reference box for etymology. This will give you, uh, this will allow you to trace back the word to its root, and it'll give you a deeper understanding on uh, the makeup of that word and, and what it really means. So it tells you to go um, to H6760, and the word is still sailor, but it means to limp and become lame. Now, the most high. We removed a rib from man, and this rib is something curved, a side, timber, plank, beam, board, also to limp and become lame. Here's wisdom. The rib that was removed from Adam was the staff. This was the shepherd's staff. The staff as a symbol of guidance. Something curved, plank as in wood, beam, board, a side, and limp. Because again, the woman being the help me and the support of man will also uh, line up with the, she with, with the shepherd's staff. But the staff is a, a symbol of guidance. Now the word multiply, earlier I told you to hold on and jot that down because we was going to come back to it. The word multiply corresponds to H7235 in the concordance, and that word is Rabah, to multiply, Rabah. So now I'm going to show you the play on this word rib. If you understand the Hebrew, you'll understand the A, E, I, O, and U is sort of uh, interchangeable. There is no vowels, right? So we just pull those vowels out, and you're just left with the R and the B. So the word rib and rob is basically the same words. And the word rob, meaning to uh, increase and multiply, is the root to this word rabah. But I want you to go back to your Strong's G4461, and you're going to get the word rabbi, master, teacher. And it's going to trace back to the Hebrew H7227, which is that word rob. Rob, and it means to increase and multiply, showing the connection between the rabbi and uh, the rabbi, the multiply, right? When he, the most I told uh, Adam and Eve, he blessed them and, and told them to be, to be fruitful and multiply. This was Adam and his rib or his rob. The only way Adam would be able to multiply is through his rob, which is his wife or his rib. So this is why the rib was used because not only did it denote um, the staff, but it is also pointing to the rabbi because the son of wisdom, the sons of God will all be master teachers and they would all come in the line of a shepherd. Here go your seven shepherds, Abel, Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, David, and Yahshua, who was called the good shepherd. They come in the line of the shepherd because these are the children of the woman, also known as the, the spirit of wisdom, the Holy Spirit or the staff. And so now it's going to throw a little bit of light on Psalms 23. Your rod and your staff comforts me. The rod represents the, the commandments and the judgments of the Most High. These are masculine. And the staff represents uh, the, the, the tool of guidance. This is the Holy Spirit and this is feminine. So your rod and your staff comforts me. This is speaking about the law, statutes, and the commandments, the judgments, and the Holy Spirit, whose job it is to uh, teach you and guide you through these commandments and keeping you from uh, the judgments. So we see the masculine and the feminine principle working together. When the Most High created man as male and female in the beginning, he told them to also have dominion. 
And so this is the rod and the staff having dominion. Every ruler, uh, and we can see this in the pictures of the pharaohs, every ruler was in possession of the rod and the staff because this was also a symbol of rulership. And so now I want to show the woman as wisdom, but also as covenants in the Bible. And so right here, I have three types of women, and we're going to be dealing with three forms of wisdom. And with each one of these wisdoms, uh, just like with a woman, when you uh, marry your woman, you're entering into a covenant with her. So when a man is married to a woman, symbolically, he is entering into a covenant with a certain type of wisdom. And so first, the first type of wisdom we're going to deal with is the whore. Now, you don't have to be in covenant to, to deal with the whore. The, the whore represents religion. This represents that the wisdom of the world, right? This is the wisdom that everybody can uh, join in on. They can, everybody can participate and everybody's in possession of this wisdom. Then you have the strange woman. Now, the strange woman is oftentimes uh, referring to um, wisdom from another nation, a foreign wisdom right but it also denotes the esoteric wisdom now the reason it's called strange when dealing with the esoteric because the esoteric is a mixture of good and evil see when dealing with the esoteric uh, doctrines you have good and you have evil uh, mixed in and you know in all of them a lot of them can be used either way for both good and evil which is what make that uh, strange right but you have your um knowledge of good and evil that's fallen in this category and then you have what's known as the virgin now yes you will have to be in a covenant or you will have to marry uh this form of wisdom this form of wisdom is also known as the mysteries this is spiritual wisdom this is also um defined as revelations this wisdom will come directly from the father this wisdom have never been uh, touched by man man can't take credit for this wisdom this wisdom is pure and this, this wisdom come directly from the source, right? So this is this is dealing with the virgin. And when we go back and look at all of the different um, women that Solomon was dealing with, we now understand that this is also a uh, metaphor for him dealing with many different gods and many different types of um, wisdom, so to speak. First Kings, the 11 chapter, verses 1 through 8 reads but king solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of pharaoh women of the moabites ammonites edomites zidonians and hittites so really what what we're reading here is that solomon was in possession of all of these different types of wisdom he had the wisdom or the religion of of the pharaohs of the moabites the ammonites the edomites the zidonians and the hittites of the nations concerning which the most I said unto the children of Israel, you shall not go into them, neither shall you come in, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon claved unto these in love, and he had seven hundred wives, princes, and three hundred concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. See, this is what the Messiah was teaching when he said no man can uh, have two masters. He's either going to love one and hate the other. And this is why the first commandment is to worship the Most High and the Most High only, right? And so because Solomon uh, was worth dealing with all these different types of wisdoms, his heart wasn't pure. The Most High wasn't, wasn't number one in his heart. And this is where uh, Solomon fell. But it says, Solomon cleaved unto these in love, and he had 700 wives, princes, 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. You see how Solomon dealing with these many different women is also connected to him having many different gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Most High as was the heart of David, his father. For Solomon went after Asherah, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Most High and went not fully after him as did at David, his father. Then says Solomon, excuse me, then did Solomon build a high place for Kamash, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon, 
and likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense unto their gods. Again, the connection with Solomon having all of these women is that he had all of these different forms of wisdom. He was worshiping all these different gods. And, and this is again going in line with the woman representing uh, wisdom. She won't always represent wisdom from above. She can represent, as we showed earlier, she can represent the wisdom of the world as a whore. She can represent esoteric wisdom as a strange woman. And she can also represent uh, pure wisdom from above as the virgin, right? And when a man is married to his wife, that is symbolic to him being joined to a certain type of wisdom. And so dealing with Solomon, marrying all of these different women uh, in the exoteric religious way, you know, they would teach you that this meant that he was married to many different women. And as a result of that, you have a lot of different people out there who teach that it's okay to marry a lot of different women, which that's fine. I get it. But what we're giving is a deeper understanding on how um, this story is more or less a reflection of Solomon dealing with many types of wisdom. And as a result of him dealing with all of these different wisdoms, his heart was turned away from worshiping the Most High only. And so he started to deal with all these other gods. Now we'll understand why all of these different uh, ancient mystery religions had a sign for the woman and the sun. Now over to your left, you have a list of all uh, men in mythology that was all said to be the sons of God. And they all was a part of um, a virgin birth, right? You have Horus, Tammuz, Krishna, Buddha, Zoroaster, Quetzalcoatl, and Mithra. And again, if you looked at, uh, if you check out that first video I did, you'll see how each one of these uh, these signs right here, uh, the nations that they come from, are the nations that are recorded in your Bible. And this is showing the the, the connection between all these ancient religions, and showing that they had a common source. They all taught the uh, story or the teaching of the Holy Spirit and the sons of God. And so when you see the, the child and the woman nurturing him, this is symbolic to the spirit of wisdom or the Holy Spirit raising up or nurturing the sons of God until they be uh, formed in the very full grown image of their father, which would, which would be the image of Christ. Okay. And so these concepts have always existed. And what happened was you had the, 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 the priesthood whether it was for gain or whatever the purpose may be, started to teach the people the exoteric religion and started to teach the people the symbols um, as true. And only certain people was allowed to get the truth behind these symbols and what they really stood for. And eventually, whether they was lost uh, due to war or again, for greedy, selfish gain, the understanding of these symbols just sort of went away. But yet we see different nations or civilizations with these same symbols all right so these this principle of the woman or the holy spirit the spirit of wisdom as the mother feeding the child was already uh in play amongst the ancients even in your, in your bible the book of peter uh first peter second chapter second verse he say as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby See, the, the word or the holy writings was always referred to as the milk, right? This was the uh, basic rules on right and wrong and morality that every person must drink from in order to learn before you can uh, mature and grow spiritually. Uh, also in the book of Isaiah uh, 28, Isaiah 28, 9, uh, Isaiah say, Whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. So we see that the woman representing the spirit of wisdom, representing the Holy Spirit and her job um, as a comforter, leading and guiding and nurturing the child with the sincere milk that you may grow and until you be formed in the image of Christ, which is the son of God. And so now here's wisdom. The mystery of the woman and child. The only way a woman can give birth to a child without the help of a man is when he is born of the Spirit. In the book of John, the third chapter, fifth verse, 
uh, we see Yahshua say, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 6, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. And so now this is going to give, uh, this is going to throw light on the whole misunderstanding that we receive with the Immaculate Conception. Right? The woman giving birth to the child is the Holy Spirit of bringing forth the Christ. So uh, when you drop down to the book of John, first chapter, verses 12 through 13, we read, But as many as received him, now this is talking about the word when he had became flesh. This is talking about Yahshua uh, manifesting the Christ in the flesh. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. See, here, here, here's the key to understanding what it means that the virgin will bring forth the son. Not born of the will of the flesh, not born of blood, not born of the will of man, but of the Most High. You see, Yahshua represented the first begotten the first begotten meaning there were many more sons to follow but as many as received him to them he gave the power to become the sons of God as many as believed that he was who he said he was that he came to give us uh, this truth that was given to him by the father to all of those who received him to them he gave the power to become the sons of God he gave them the truth and to them, even to them that believe on his name or believe on his office, right? Because there was a lot of people saying that Yahshua had the devil and they believed that he was doing things, um, all of these different miracles from the power of, of Beelzebub. And so you had some who believed that and then you had the other saying, now he came from the Most High, the Most High sent him, right? So all those who believed that the Most High sent him and that the message he had came from the Father, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God. Now, one thing I want you to understand about being joined to the Holy Spirit, one of the things that the Holy Spirit will do is come into your heart and break up that hard heart and make that heart soft and make that heart uh, flesh-like in order to receive the word. When we go back to the book of Galatians, the fifth chapter, we read that uh, the fruit of the Spirit, and I'm going to just name a few off the top of my head, love, uh, meekness, long-suffering, uh, gentleness, these are our feminine uh, attributes. And because spirits are genderless, the only way we could put it in a category of masculine or feminine is by the attributes. And so these attributes is pointing out that the Holy Spirit is um, the divine feminine. And these attributes that the Holy Spirit possess are created in women naturally, which means you have the ability to walk in the spirit um, on a higher level than, than the average man. It's already in your nature. Uh, if you would move in what's known as your feminine energy, you already have the key to walking um, in the spirit. The only thing that's left is to be joined to the word. Now remember the rod and the staff. The, the rod representing the law, statutes, and the commandments, the word of the Most High. Remember when the word was made flesh, that's who Yahshua came to represent. Every son of God is the word of God made flesh. And so uh, when a woman is joined to the masculine principle, which is the word of the most high, she now has the ability to become the embodiment of the uh, divine feminine, also known as the Holy Spirit or the Ruach HaKodesh, divine guidance. When Yahshua came teaching about the kingdom, he also taught about forgiveness and walking in love because love is a frequency and it's on that frequency where the kingdom of heaven exists. You see, love is the highest frequency that we can attain to on this physical plane. And because women are able to walk in a love that we men don't understand in the same way the darkness can't understand the light, then that would mean that women have the ability to walk in um, on that frequency much easier than us men. It takes the Holy Spirit coming into our life and softening up our heart so that we can, you know, forgive and learn to walk in these uh, principles. But when the woman's divine feminine uh, is activated and she now represents the embodiment of the Holy Spirit or the spirit of wisdom, what happens is her aura or her aura, she'll create an aura. And that aura is her light or her glow. This is why you'll see 
um, when they show the pictures of Yahshua, you'll see a lot of the times he have a halo <clears throat> because he's in possession of the glow. And it is the Holy Spirit who is the oil who bring that glow. So when the women walk in that um, in that light and they receive that aura, depending on how strong your, your, your spiritual walk is, will depend on how big your aura is, how great and how wide, how far your aura reach. And when two or more come together, this is why when you say when two or more come together, there I am in the midst of you. Because two, two people having a great aura will create uh, that whole area in the midst of that aura is the frequency of love. This is where the kingdom of heaven exists. This is how we reach the Father and tap in. And so having women who uh, have the ability to grow an aura much larger than, larger than us men and two or three or four of them get together. Um, everything that's within the reach of their aura is now in that frequency and this is how we're going to bring the kingdom of heaven on earth it's going to take the woman to uh, show us how to love on that level just like it's the holy spirit's job to come in and to soften up that heart